Hi everyone. Thank you very much for having me here. So my name is Gladys Kuzi. I am a data technology practice uh, lead for Google in the UK and Ireland. And today I'm gonna give you a short introduction to productionizing machine learning systems and also give you some focus on the business case and why we need this and what are the trends coming up so that you guys not only know how to productionize systems and what you worry about, but also where the money is, where the business needs come from, so you guys can create amazing ideas for a future startup or future venture, or even your own company to bring those use cases in. <laughs> so this talk, I would like you to have four takeaways. The first one, why this is so important now? The use cases in enterprise, the key issues when we design ML products, and the steps to deliver winning ML products. So the market demand. We have seen a lot of research going on with Gartner and McKinsey, and research has shown that eight out of 10 businesses, they are implementing or plan, planning to implement machine learning by 2020. And the insights driven uh, businesses will take over from the businesses who are not that well specialized into uh, machine learning. And the value that ML will bring to businesses will be about $1.2 trillion a year. And by 2035, the AI technologies, they are projected to increase business productivity by up to 40%. And that means that uh, especially if a user who are specialized on data science, they are going to be able to focus on the insights rather than focusing on places where they don't add much value. And it's no surprise that in virtually every industry has mission critical use cases that can be boiled down into a, a form of of data, and I will talk a little bit about the, the data sets that are more common in the industry today. So in terms of mission critical use case across industries, for instance, in, in retail, we have uh, predicting the likelihood of stocks out of price uh, or price elasticity, so you can optimize your product inventory. In finance, we have predicting the potential of large claims or the likelihood of a fraud, so you can manage your risk. And one of the things that is quite important in machine learning is to understand the cost of a miss missing transaction or a bad prediction. So if you are a retailer selling, for instance, fruit, and if someone, if you recommend for someone to buy uh, uh, if you miss the price of a banana or an apple, that is something. But in finance, the cost of a fraud, if you miss, for instance, a one million pounds or something like this, so the cost of a wrong prediction is much higher. So you have to really understand the, the, the business and the industry you were building those systems for. And in marketing, we also have uh, the ability to predict customer future lifetime value. So you can invest on that customer and the likelihood of churn, so you can better understand your customers. And these use cases that are so core to your respective industries, even in small improvements in model quality, can have significant impact and implications on them. And the structured data is likely to drive most of the AI impact uh, as of today. According to McKinsey Global Institute, Data in its basic form, structured data, is likely to drive most of AI impact with time series being a close second. So we can see that the structured data in tabular form, so like the ones that we see in spreadsheets, they're the ones that are going to drive the most of the value on, on impact uh, in AI going forward. We also have the uh, many trends happening as of today. So we have data created by IoT devices versus end users. So data created by IoT devices is 277 times bigger than the ones created by users like us. And 40% of data will come from sensors by 2020. By the end of this year, 
all the we are seeing that all the data is being generated by aggregate sensors and intelligent devices, and three million new devices are connected every week to the internet. And we as humans possessing personal data, we're gonna we're gonna have like a majority of us with over five terabytes of personal data being stored somewhere in the cloud or in platforms such as uh, Facebook, such as like uh, in medical records uh, industries as well. So there's a lot of data being out there. And when we, I talk about sensors, I would like you to understand the dome of connected machines. So the dome of connected machines has been driven firstly, basically by the Moore's law that the, the more the computing processing increases, the likelihood of the price uh, will kind of uh, the double of the processing, the cheaper the, the, the sensors are going to be. However, Moore's law is being not very well uh, in practice today because of the complexity that we have in making chip is smaller and smaller and smaller. So we have like uh, many constraints defined by physics. A uh, second one is the Metcalf law, which is the power of networks. The more nodes you have in network, the more power you have. And then we can see, understand this pretty much by looking at social networks, LinkedIn and like and Facebook or some others. The more connected connections you are, the more power you have in that network, because the more data you exchange, the more uh, you can collect information from connectivities and from connections. Advancements in big data technologies. We have a lot of advancements in in databases that are catered for um, for hosting big data and big information, and also big data technology for streaming analytics as well. And lastly, but not least, ML frameworks advancements. Today we have a myriad of um, frameworks coming every single month, and it's quite difficult to keep up with those because we have new advancements every day. So the zone of connected machines means that by 2050, we're gonna have 8 billion humans on the planet and 50 billion devices connected on the internet and collect information about us, about businesses, about enterprises, about value chains, about stakeholders, about how we move and commute and communicate into, the, into our living. And all that data is going to serve for us to drive business cases and, and to create amazing products using AI. And one thing that is for us to understand how that has impacted us as of today is for us to look in the past. In the past, we had traditional multi proprietary systems. So we had a proprietary ICT infrastructure that only a dedicated device would work on that particular infrastructure. And only application A could consume that information. And application B would also rely on a proprietary access infrastructure that only a dedicated device would be able to consume that information. An example is a building. So in building, we have access control systems. We have systems called SCADA systems that are for energy. We have energy management systems. We have building management systems where we have, for instance, our conditioning and ventilation connected to those uh, building management systems that are, you can just see this BMS as a big box full of sensors that collect information from buildings. We also have systems for security elevators and fire and many others. But the problem in here is that for you to gather insight about how well a building is operating, you have to go to multiple dashboards and the data comes in different formats, different velocity, different variety, different veracity as well, because sometimes data might not uh, fault in the system, you might have missing information as well. So that was quite difficult for us to do any insights with data science on those systems and bringing that data together. But as of today, with the Internet of Things, Something that was seen before by just as, as a lamppost, today can be seen as a multi purpose device. So, lamppost today, we can power this with devices for air quality, for mobility sensing, for security surveillance. We can also have all those sensors in a converged system 
that will enable us to navigate through the data from all the different layers of our particular system. So today, we have sensors uh, everywhere, and those sensors, they are connected via connectivity layer that is then passed through Hunchworth. Sorry, there is a also play here, sorry. And that data is passed to a network and then come as data as a service. And that data as a service is the data that is um, sharing a, a common semantic, common uh, format, common metadata, and then we can consume that data and do uh, any application that we, we want to do in our IoT device. So it's a work in an industry that you have to consume data from systems and also from IoT sensors. It's quite important for you to build those layers to get to the point that you have data as a service, that you can consume that data and deliver uh, the use case that you want to. But one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that with the intelligent web, the web 3.0 that we are experiencing today, we have huge data volume, but very little of that data is low in complexity because we have videos, we have many other, uh, we have images, and we have complex information. And what are the opportunities for us? As data scientists, why are work so important as of today? I'm gonna to give you some use cases that I hope is going to inspire you into businesses and to also uh, a startup you might want to trade. So we are wasting 500 trillion water and food that we are gonna throw away. We spend, we throw away one, 170 billion worth of food every single year. One in four cities around the world, they experience water scarcity. One in nine people around the world, they are undernourished. And every 15 seconds, a child dies because they have nothing to eat. We have a huge problem in our logistics, in our supply chain. Why we cannot get the food produced that we waste so much to the people who need it the most? So that is a huge problem for us to solve. We need data to give us the insight to that. As of today, we have 1 billion cars, and in the next uh, 10 years, we're going to have 2 billion cars in the road. And us, as humans, we spend, in average, if you have a driver's license for a driver, we spend four to six months of our lives trying to find a parking space. And that is going to become worse as we have more cars on the street. And 96% of the times, the cars, they're not used to its full capacity. They're unused. They're left parking somewhere. And 81% of the time, they're unfilled. We only have a driver in a car that it could fit five to six people. So those are huge problems that we have to tackle. And that's why high uh, ride sharing apps, such as Lyft and Uber, and those, they're quite important for us. Because uh, that, besides reducing the carbon emission that we have, for because of congestion, we can also make use of our assets to its full potential. So um, the cost of congestion is over 200 billion every single year for our uh, for our city. And besides, one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that autonomous vehicles are quite important for us, but not only because we want to be lazy watching Netflix while we drive, but because 65 million people, they are on wheelchairs, and 280 million people, they are visually impaired, and we are creating amazing astonishing cars, but we have very little, 3.4 billion invested in research for us to use those smart cars to help people to regain their access to the city. So those use cases, they are quite important. So we have 92% of the world population exposed to very high level of pollution, 3 million people, they die because of the pollution. And pollution does not only cause a problem to our lungs, but also causes a cognitive impairment. So we become uh, cognitively impaired, less intelligent, let's put it this way. And inefficiency, inefficiency in the city is what is causing that the most. But with all those problems, we have a lot of opportunity because we have data, we have big data technology, we have tons of stuff. However, if we look in industry, the majority of people productionizing machine learning, they're still in research and development. 
25% of them are piloting, 6% are implementing actually, and only 6% of industries they have machine learning implemented, deployed in production today. And when I say machine learning, I'm not talking about machine learning, those incomplete ones, I'm talking about real machine learning products. And we need to understand the business needs. I will skip to this slide, but this slide is just about understanding how you break down problems, a big problem, like how do I solve, how do I cure the patient, for instance, with this example. The first thing we have to know is if the cancer, if, if the cancer is present or not. So that is a detection problem. And then we have to understand what type that cancer is. So that is a classification problem. To what extent is that cancer present in that patient? So it's a segmentation problem. What X represents in the context of this patient? So we look into medical records and then we use natural language processing for this. What is the likely outcome by using all this data? And then we can then satisfy the business needs by making a recommendation. This patient should, re should receive treatment X, Y, and Z. So we see that a question, what is the treatment for this patient to survive can be broken down into many different use cases. And this is what we have to focus on. So, but we have a, a, a utopia, like a very fake news, that the only thing you need to do is to learn from data, use data against your model, and then do the model at monitor accuracy. And that is a very big lie because that's not how machine learning products work. And then we have seen a lot of use cases that have failed in production. So, for instance, we have seen uh, Google, um, and I work for Google, which was a very big backlash, was using unbalanced data so you cannot recognize people very well. Apple fake ID cannot tell Chinese or Asian people apart. And also the judicial system using uh, data that has bias intrinsic into the data. And so in this case, they released the person who was low risk and catch the person in the prison, the person that was considered a high risk. The problem is that the low risk person committed a crime immediately after being released from prison. So there's a lot of like bias in the data that we produce. And also at Amazon, we had a problem with sexist candidate selection system that they would um, not consider like women as part of like data processing in terms of hiring. And we also have the racist recommendation system that was for Amazon Prime to lead delivery. So ever put people in those regions, they are Amazon Prime customers, but only the people in the gray area, they were not served by the same day delivery. And although they were Prime customers, and those gray areas, they are African American areas, so Amazon was skipping those areas because in their data they had bias that those people they could not afford uh, paying for their services. So we have to be very careful about the system we put out there because they can learn from the data that we give to them. So users might be very scared about using AI into their uh, daily lives. So launching machine learning solutions, we have to first understand our problem, validate, create our model, evaluate, serve, and then improve it over time. So the applying machine learning challenges, we have the need for an integrated data science environment. We have to make sure that we can replicate what we have in development environment into production environment. We have to train and tune our machine learning model at scale. We have to deploy and manage and monitor our machine learning models and APIs. And I'm not talking about software engineering here. For software engineering, we we go, we write our code, and then we productionize that code, and then we check for, we do unit testing, we do integration testing, and then we do monitoring production in machine learning because the data drives the behavior of the system. You have to unit test your data as well. So during the deployment and management, you have to do that as well. We also have to take care about removing every single manual process from the, pro from, from the process of productionizing. So we have to have automation and continuous training and delivery because then we can pick it up what is the best time for me to retrain my model. It cannot be a manual task. And transition, transitioning from proof of concept to production is something that takes a lot of time because you have to understand the nature and the huge scale that you have to cater for. And integrating with other 
instances and data sets and services are something quite difficult. So if you have a POC on your machine, how do you deploy those systems into a cloud system that will have data coming from different sources, data coming from instances to our own GCP and Google GCP, data coming from um, SQL, from Cloud Spanner, or data coming from uh, BigQuery ML, uh, and data coming from other sources as well, from Cloud Storage. And you also have the time, the cost, and complexity to build those systems, especially in feature engineering, which takes most of the time from data scientists into cater for that. So in experimental data science, the one that I said you have in your machine, the, what you only have accomplished there is to create the ML code. As you go into production, you have to understand that you have the challenges of data collection, feature engineering, logging and management, the data management, the management of the data related to your machine learning code. You have to have the metadata for that because then you can, if you need to roll back should something go wrong, you can go and read that metadata and see, okay, this is the model that was working well before the system crashed, so let's go back to that one. So you have to have the data management done correctly, not only for your for the data itself, so you have the provenance of the data, but also for the model. And you also have to have exploration and analysis tools, especially the ones that are automated. So automated data visualization, so you can understand the data before you productionize your system. Train your model at scale, and again, automate and monitor, automate and monitor this at all times, and serve batch and online prediction. We have multi-mode of offering this to, to customers. So there's a lot of things that we have to do, not only writing the ML code. ML code is just a small, tiny part of that. And there's a combinatorial thing for us to worry about. When we do the data preparation, we have to properly, properly handle imbalanced data. So if you have a data set that is unbalanced, you have to make sure that you cater for that. Otherwise, you're going to have, like, if you see more, more examples than tasks, you are more likely to get tasks for fish than you have of getting the dogs. You have to look for outliers, for missing values, and highly high cardinality feature, features. So if you see, that column that you have in your data set has which is the same number uh, as of the number of rows that you have. That that column is adding more noise than value to your data set, so you are better like remove that from your data set. So looking to the data preparation, most of this is manual, and you have to move this into something more automated. And going to feature engineering, you have to select the proper processing. Uh, mechanism for numbers, classes, strings, nested fields, and there are multiple options for columns and hundreds of columns in a table for you to understand what is the best one. Moving into the next stage, you have the architecture selection, but you have to select the best model architecture for dozens available. You have to understand we need a linear uh, regression, this is a random forest, and then you have to keep up with those and keep up with the newest advancement. So people they create, uh, for instance, uh, random forest and then update those models on a monthly basis. So you have to keep up with that as well. Then you have the parameter selection. For each architecture, you have to select the right values for each type of parameter. So the learning rate, regularization, the number of layers, the hidden nodes, the active function function, and then the pruning strategy that you have to select the right strategy, for instance, for ensemble, are you doing groups, you know, bagging, and model evaluation. So you have to evaluate your model at the data set level, because if you have any change in the distribution of the data, you are going to have your model performance going down. You'll have to do also evaluation at feature level, at prediction level, to ensure the behavior is fully understood before deployment. And by the way, if you mess in any one of those parameters, you'll have to redo those all over again. The entire process can take months, potentially dooming ML projects project altogether. As executive sponsors, they lose interest. And this is a process rinse and repeat after tens of times per use cases. And if you're messing in one of those, you'll have to start from scratch, start from everything again. So 
Production IV data science involves the data processing, the model design, the tuning, the evaluation, the deployment, and the updating of those models. And if we look this into um, how we would look at a pipeline, we have the data ingestion, the exploration, the transformation of the data, the data validation, the data splitting, that is in the dev pipeline. And then we have to do our model building, train at scale. So, and another thing, do I need this video training that will, the, the size of the data will tell you a lot about this. The model validation, how we, what are the parameters you're going to use to validate your model, and to select and to log your model as well. And in production environment, deployment has to be automated. You have to serve this to the X number of users that you have and monitor the model, monitor the data and the features that your model is seeing and ask the request and have model alerting and optimization of files so that you know if your model is performing the way it is supposed to perform in production time. So I'm going to go very quick into some of the best practices for us. So in model understanding, do the sanity check. So auto data types, handling, numeric, categorical, and text and image. Try to use tools that allow you to do the auto visualization statistics. So the minimum, the max, and the average, all of those are quite important. Auto histograms of four continuous or categorical values. Try to understand the percentage of, uh, of num values because that can tell you about the scarcity of the data, and that is something that you have to take into account when building and architecting your model. Have the auto verification of future values consistency across the entire pipeline and identify the dependencies of the features. And one of the things that you have to bear in mind is that you cannot have all the features that you want. You have to select the ones that will contribute to your model because as in software engineering, each feature you use is like doing an import. So that feature is a huge dependency on your model. So it's like doing an import of like a package, like import pandas is the same thing as using a feature. When you are using a feature, it's the same. So you have to make sure that you do use the, the ones that you, your model really needs. And the data ingestion might come in back and streaming. And for data integration, we have many uh, different tools we, we can use for the big data, like we can use a Spark, Hive, and HBase. Validate the data, also correct and remove incomplete, incorrect, inaccurate, or irrelevant features in the input data, which is exactly what I said before. And also shape the input data and perform the data aggregation, ensure that you can create new features uh, in a way that is automated as possible as you go into production, remove bias and try to find out very highly correlated features or features that can uh, make your model to be a bias towards something that you don't want to accomplish and, and remove those features as well. The other thing is the model understand the availability of labeled data because people might say, oh, we have tons of data available, but how many of that data is labeled? So you have to make sure that you have the labeled up or labeled data to be selected for the model training, and then that you split this in train validation and test, and you have that strategy beforehand. Because if you don't understand uh, the data available, you don't know which type of model if you're going to use supervised or unsupervised um, classification, for instance, and it's quite important to know. And do the auto hyper parameter tuning, defining the search space, the early stopping, the termination policy so that you know that your model has a converged, so you don't need to search for any or other optimization. And create a platform for you that supports any ML library, so site Fact to learn TensorFlow, TensorFlow extended with explainability as well. PyTorch H2O is something quite important and is something that is relevant for the community. And any language as well, make sure that your model you can code using any language. It's irrespective of the language or the ML library, your model is something, your pipeline is something that you can build. Evaluate with the model debugging, evaluate select the best metric for each type of thing that you are trying to do. If you're doing classification, if you're doing regression, use the ones that you uh, that is catered for that particular model uh, uh, that you have in production. 
whether quantification or regression or any other kind, select the best evaluation metrics for those. In terms of serving, third, uh, what we recommend as best practices to serve the transformers of your pipeline are served as microservices, feature engineering, feature selection, all those kind of things are microservices. They are all the provisions uh, in the infrastructure with policies and configuration for access and also using GPU views uh, for you to uh, increase the performance of your model. CICD is something quite important. And the, the best practices like the rolling of your provisioning to be to support canary deployment and do A-B testing as well. If you have already something in production and you want to check whether what you produce is better or not, A-B testing and having a strategy for that is something quite good. And uh, also be GDPR compliant, have model explainability built in as the default as part of your model. A model versioning rollback that goes back to my point about uh, having um, metadata about the model and uh, the deployments that we we see as best practices are the ones developed, for instance, on Kubernetes that you can use Argo and uh, Argo workflow for you to manage like the workflow of your containers. We can use Argo uh, events to, for instance, uh, if uh, your model degrades in production and you have to retrain your model or select different features. So Argo event allows you to act upon the action of certain events in production. And there are many other tools for you to use as your server. And uh, as a model, it's something that is something that is alive. You have to see it as a live being because it will change as the data changes in the environment. So make sure alerting services and dashboarding and self healing capabilities they are available and run the assessment metrics against the threshold, check for anomaly and optimize between competing models because in the end of the day, you have to deliver the business value that the businesses they are asking for you to, to comply with. So make sure that it's matching the KPIs. So if the KPIs are for you to predict uh, whether a customer are going to make a deposit on the account based on a market campaign, make sure that those KPIs, they're achievable using your model. So you can say that your model has increased in 90% the ability for a company to predict whether a customer will uh, subscribe to their services. So make sure that KPIs they are available as well so that you meet not only the technical bit, but also the business side as well. And remember that garbage in is garbage out. There's no way for you to jujitsu your way out of that data. So the first thing for you to keep in mind is in productionizing ML is the data. And if the data is labeled, if the data is complete, if there's inconsistency on the data, you're going to find yourself spending most of your time curating data and make sure the data is catered for, for productionizing your system. So that's it that I had today to give you an overview of the current trends, the business needs, and what are in machine learning that we have to look into for us to be able to productionize those systems. So thank you very much for your time. And it has been a pleasure to give you this presentation. Thank you very much.